Good morning, everybody. I have checked the time, and it now being 9.30 local, I think we should probably start the session. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, IETF 117 DTN working group session. So this is your chance to realize you are in the wrong room. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is the session title working group. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just take it to the mailing list. <laughs> um, can I? Yeah, there we go. So, as with all ITF working groups, this is covered under the note well. I hope by Wednesday of an ITF session, you will have read this at least once. Uh, it is my responsibility as a chair to draw your attention to this. Uh, and make sure you understand uh, the content and what it requires of you and what you can expect in return from uh, the IETF in terms of uh, good behavior, um, ensuring that uh, as a participant uh, you are not feeling harassed or coerced in any way, but equally your understanding where you stand in terms of IPR. We will not go through this for ages and ages. Uh, please go and look at the documents if you are at all unsure. Um, and this is the note really well, which is new for this session, which is very much talking about uh, making sure we have a positive environment and that people are not feel feeling harassed or aggressively attacked on their opinions, etc. Uh, we are blessed to have a member of the Ombuds team uh, in the back of the room, so uh, we will be under strict um, examination but uh in general dtn has not really had these problems so long may that continue but the facilities are there if you want it equally uh meeting tips so please uh in this post covid days with me echo please make sure you are signed in using the me echo in person tool if you are in person uh if you are uh remotely participating i'm assuming you can hear me through the me echo tool um, if you're going through some other audio video system, just for attendance, um, please make sure you sign in through the MeTeco tool. Um, again, we will be operating a queue unified between remote and on site participants. So if you wish to join the queue, please use the on site tool to click the raise hand button. Um, and therefore, it just makes everyone's job a little bit easier. Um, again, remote participants. Please try and keep your mic uh, muted and to save a little bit on the bandwidth. Uh, we don't really need to see you listening and nodding along. Um, pleasant though it is, it, it makes it a little bit distracting for everyone else. So please keep your video off as well, unless you are presenting. Ed. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, otherwise, uh, these are these are the links. We're in the middle of the week, so I, I think that we're all familiar with where to find the agenda and Meet Echo and other information. Uh, specifically for DTN, uh, this is uh, our agenda. I want to walk through it briefly and then just take a moment to see if there's anything uh, that we want to sort of agenda bash. Uh, we want an update of the URI scheme, uh, which uh, Rick had just uh, posted a, a minor uh, grammatical update uh, just recently. And then we want to look at the network management work, <clears throat> starting with an architecture by Sarah Heiner and then the data model uh, with Brian Sipos. Uh, following on, uh, Brian Sipos has some updates to the COSI security context, which is currently in working group last call, and then a discussion around EID patterns. And I, I think we've seen even some mailing list uh, traffic in the past two days related to that. Uh, Mark has a, a Yang model uh, for BP. And then Eric has a discussion of a CLA for BP directly over Ethernet. And then we have two areas that we want to get working group uh, discussion and feedback on. Uh, one of them is an adoption discussion around putting uh, applications over BP, and in particular, HTTP and SMTP. And then lastly, a discussion on how we would allocate allocators in the IP and URI scheme, which was something that had uh, quite a bit of mailing list traffic. I think we can get through all of that in, in roughly two hours. If we do, we'll have some open mic 
and, and some wrap up. Uh, before we go on, are there any uh, concerns uh, or questions about the agenda or any agenda bashing? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so then, uh, lastly, we do need someone uh, who will agree uh, to take minutes. Uh, is there someone who would come in and volunteer to, to uh, have point on the minutes? Although we do ask that everyone uh, join the shared notepad because the more people we have taking notes, the better notes we will have by the end of the meeting. I know that Adam's online. Adam, can we rely on you for minutes? I, I just heard. We're yeah. already doing it. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of work in our, in our charter for the working group. Uh, we had put together some initial milestones when we looked at this. Uh, they started with July 2022, aspirationally finishing in July of 2024, which, which uh, we are about halfway through, and this is uh, how we would score ourselves right now. There is good work going on in, in the delay tolerant management architecture, and there's good work going on in the naming, addressing, and architecture, particularly around IP and URI scheme. Uh, and there's also work going on into the network management protocols, and that is uh, what we're talking about, for example, mostly uh, today. But there are a larger number of things in front of the working group for which we need uh, energy and, and drafts once we get through this initial network management and, and IPN naming and addressing, in particular, process signaling, bundle bundle encapsulation, quality of service or otherwise flow or data labeling uh, that comes in in neighborhood and peer discovering and eventually also key management. So th this is simply something we wanted to put in front of the working group to say that we do have a charter, we do have items and milestones, and we are trying to make sure that as this initial work gets through, we are adopting and putting working group energy into the other things that are in our milestones. <clears throat> In, in, the, in the vein of let's look at and get through some of the work that we have, we do have two documents currently in working group last call. One is the BPSEC COSI security context. We're going to have a presentation on that later. The other is a smaller document, <clears throat> which is uh, an entry into an administration records type registry. Uh, that one uh, is currently in working group last call. We have not seen any sort of significant concerns. So we wanted to just take a, a short moment at the beginning and ask if anyone has any concerns or differences uh, related to this particular uh, document, because otherwise it will successfully go through working group last call. Okay, noted. Uh, and then we will expect coming out of today that things like the IP and URI scheme and the uh, network management architecture would be going into working group last call. So if you have not read those documents, uh, please do, and please catch up on them and prepare for a review of that as we go forward. And that's what we have. All right. So our next one is to uh, go to Rick for IPN schema update. So, uh, good. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the IPN schema update, I thought I would try and just run through the major differences between the IETF 116 uh, draft of the document, which was 01, all the way through to where we are now, which is 06. Uh, next slide, please, or the flicker. Sorry, excuse the technical difficulties. Okay, so the substantive changes between uh, where we were at 116, sorry, draft 03 to 06. Really, the substantive changes have been around the definition of services and the registry put in place in this document for services and um, what they mean, what we mean by services and how we manage them. The other major topic was around the allocator identifier registry advice to designated experts. So the conversation on the mailing list proceeded uh, well. There was lots of discussion around this to the point where the technical detail advice for the designated experts is pretty clear and non-contentious. The governance aspects around how one hands out fairly these allocator identifiers to an organization, definition of organization, et cetera, et cetera, has become the sticking point. And to that point, I'm not going to cover it now. We're putting a dedicated slot in the agenda, as I just said, to cover that in particular. So I'm not gonna talk about it now. Next slide, please. So services, 
Um, the 03 draft talked of a service in terms of a type of service, as in a, uh, a particular... Uh, let me go through it. Instead of considering a service as some kind of generic service type, or some kind of protocol identifier, as in like a TCP port number is HTTP, you would expect that protocol to be on that port. The way we use services in IPN naming is the identifier of some logical functional unit, irrelevant of what that protocol is. It is some sub-processing unit on a node that requires a unique endpoint so that it can be identified. And that is different from what was written in the 01 to 0, uh, 00 to 03 drafts. And having reached consensus on the mailing list, that is what we now describe, which I believe is in line with current practice and the expectations of the working group. I'm letting everyone just read that definition at the bottom. Anyway, next slide, please. Given that definition of a service, we then have to go on to define what do we mean by a well-known service. And after some discussion about what well-known means, we broke it down into a criteria of the purpose of a well-known service is so that there can be a reasonable default assumed by a deployment so that you don't have to configure the same numbers for things which are always found to be on those service numbers. So it's about promoting that familiarity, that default and managing the operational overhead of deploying these systems. So given that a well-known service does have to be truly well-known. So it has to be publicly specified and have wide adoption. If you have a service which may be very important to your individual deployment, your individual mission, your individual environment, but it only makes sense to you. You don't need to go and register it with IANA. That's a waste of IANA's time. And it's also, it populates the registry with things that no one else is ever going to use. So the point of the registry and the onus on you to go and register something is if what you are registering is properly universally well-known and has wide adoption or is designed for wide adoption. So it hopefully reduces the, um, the work involved with organizations who are developing their own services for their own special needs, they don't have to go and register these things. So we clarify what we mean as a well-known service, and then we clarify how the registry is used. So it's by registering an entry in the service numbers registry, you are saying, Unless you receive configuration otherwise, it is safe to assume that service X will be on service number Y. It may not be, and you should handle that case. There may be a different service on that, that service number, and you should handle that as well. But it is a reasonable assumption to make that it's probably there. And that is the best that you can do with this registry. And I see Scott Burley jumping to the mic. Um, uh, Scott Burley. Um, uh, I, I think the direction here is is right. I'm concerned about interoperability. That if you that if it says fuzzy as this, that um, uh, interoperability errors will be introduced regardless. I, I think it's the sort of thing where you you do need to nail some of these things down, or or, or there will be operational problems. Um, I agree. There is a danger of interoperability here. And this is quite a loose generalization, but I, I would su suggest this is analogous to TCP port numbers, where, yeah, HTTPS is on 443, unless you specify otherwise. But equally, I don't, there is nothing guaranteeing that the thing I'm talking to on TCP port 443 is a, a TLS speaker. So I can guess and go to it, but there must be something within my protocol that then tries to establish that communication path, and with BP it's a bit gentler than that, that understands, oh no, this isn't what I was expecting and falls back. So I don't think we can universally enforce, you must use service number one for DTNMA, and you must never use service number one for anything else. I can't, in, personally, I can't see that being A, enforceable, and B, I think it will be ignored. 
I think I want to use one because I don't run DTNMA within my environment. Um, I, I want to use my magic service number. That's fine. Uh, and Scott Burley again. Uh, absolutely, you can't you, you can't really enforce it. But, the, but then almost everything in a protocol specification you can't really enforce, right? It, it's yeah. So let's yeah, try so not it, to. It, right. So um, I, I'm what I'm I guess suggesting is that. Uh, it would be desirable for these provisions to have the same uh, uh, force and intent as 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 the shalls in a protocol specification. So we'll come on to that, and I agree. Um, oh, okay, that's yeah. that's that's really what I'm mm -hmm. arguing for here is that this be sort of shall-ish. Yeah, uh, Alberto, go ahead. Rita, Alberto Montilla here. Um, I have a more general question. Do, do we really need this specified now? Um, and the reason I'm asking is, are we at the risk of uh, over-specifying, uh, you know, something that might not be required right now and creating, you know, interoperability issues because of that? Uh, again, I, I agree with the sentiment of what you say. We have the CBHE service numbers registry already. So there's prior art that as part of the IPN update, we need to address the existence of that prior art to say, what do we do given there's a CBHE service numbers registry? What does that mean in BPV7 land? What I think the document is doing correctly is saying, here is a registry. This is what the registry is for. This is how one should use it but not actually suggesting any, there is nothing, there are no initial values in that registry at all. So I'm hopefully not enforcing anyone to do anything in particular yet, but providing the facility to have such a thing in place for when it becomes necessary. And I think DTNMA may be the first consumer of this. Can I move on to the next slide? And hopefully that will address we, some, some of this. We do have Mark in the queue. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, I can. Actually, can I do the next slide and then then take some questions? So the next slide, so very quick note on CBHE service numbers registry. It will continue to exist. It is untouched. We are not updating the CBHE service numbers registry. A service from a CBHE perspective was a subtly different concept. There are a bunch of allocations which made sense for BPV6, make much less sense with this new concept of a, of a service number. Mashing the two together was going to make everything harder. It's easier to leave that registry in place. The existing allocations are absolutely fine for BPV6. Moving on. Uh, so the new registry is called the IPN Scheme URI, well-known service numbers for BPV7, because that's such an easy thing to say. And that makes it explicit that this is for bundle protocol version seven use of IPN URI. If you want to use IPN URIs for something apart from bundle protocol version seven, you're probably going to need to go and define your own service number registry. So we're, we're scaling back the scope of this registry to BPV7 only because that's kind of going towards Scott's point about uh, interoperability. Um, and after much discussion, the policy the allocation policy on that registry is designed to share the number space evenly between private use so that uh, operators of deployments can go away and use a whole bank of the numbers to their heart's content for their own purposes and various controlled uh, values with various, um, and I'll get onto it, different levels of restriction on how one achieves an allocation because an important consideration is the CBOR encoding of an unsigned integer, which is what a service number is, ranges from naught bytes to four bytes, depending on what the value is. So the, very, uh, the numbers in the range one to 24 are far more desirable if you care about encoding length than the numbers above two to the 16. So therefore, we can't say, make all the big numbers private use and keep all the small numbers for specification required because we are penalizing people who don't want to use the specified services into using poor, uh, poor, um, poor to compress number values. Hence, we're doing a 
a cut 50-50 across each of the bite lengths. Next slide, please. I have tried to diagram this in a different way from the draft to try and express the fact that with Seabor encoding of unsigned integers, you get an encoding length from naught to four bytes, octets, sorry, ITF. Naught is a funny one because the tag, the, the, uh, the type identifier is actually comes in that first leading byte giving you four bits. So it's, it's kind of a naught extra octet. So what we've said is values one to 24, which is the naught byte encoding, they're free to use. They're, they're private use. No one is going to specify any standard protocol there. The one octet encoding 25 to 127 is still private use. There are systems out there with their own service numbers. We can't get them to, to you know, constantly trample over them or withdraw, withdraw that. But having these short service numbers is, is very useful. And so we're reserving 128 to 255, so the top half of that one octet encoding, for standards action. So that is the harshest and the highest bar of adoption. So that's standards track RFC not experimental, not IRTF, and it's an IETF is going to hold that space. That's ours. However, for the two byte, two octet encoding length, half of them private use. Great. Go. That's all there for you. You can have lots of different services. You can do clever things with ephemeral service numbers on demand, etc. But we're going to keep the high half of that two octet encoding to say specification required. And these track back exactly to um, text in, and I can't remember the RFC number now, but the uh, the RFC on how to write IANA specific, um, how to get these wordings right. These 8126. 8126, there we go. And specification required means you need to publicly document your specification. It doesn't need to be IETF. It can be any other SDO. Um, and I, I'm not going to quote the text explicitly off my head because I can't remember it. But it is a much lower bar of entry but it still maintains that open specification, widely adopted criteria we said for putting entries in here. And anything of the three and four octet encoding, free for all, we're never gonna specify anything there, private use. I think that's the last slide. Uh, that is the last slide. And we have uh, Mark and then Alberto in the queue. <coughs> Um, well, it's, it's a comment about the previous discussion, but again, still holds, I guess. Um, like in the early days of the internet, you know, we, you don't necessarily know what, what will happen. So, uh, it, it's, a, therefore we may force for standard actions or an RFC for a protocol and at the end, never nobody deployed it, yep. or someone deployed it for, you know, some time, and something better came up, and so there's kind of a imperfect, uh, you know, allocations uh, here. We just need to make sure that the actual number space is well managed, but that's it. So, because we can find examples of, you know, all, all cases, and you know, there's nothing you can do with. I completely agree. I think a just enough pragmatic approach, given we don't know what the future holds, is what we have to do here. We could be far too strict, and I think that would be a mistake. Alberto? <clears throat> uh, Alberto Montilla, can you go uh, uh, back to the next slide? Oh, go, no, back. go to the next slide. Which slide? Uh, which slide? Five? Uh, the next one. The service registry example. Uh, next, uh, last one, last one, the last one. Yeah. So um, um, Rick, I'm curious about uh, um, is is the intention that the BPV7 registry would starting point would be the existing BPV6 registry? No. no. And uh, why is that? Because the for two reasons, the existing CDHE registry. Um, was very much talking, it had aligned the concept of the protocol that will be used will run on this service number with the definition of service. And we're being a little bit more verbose in our definition and trying to be a little stricter. I don't want to say better because I know the author sat behind uh, three rows back. But in retrospect, we, we think 
we can soften the definition of what it means and hence carrying the values across may not make sense. Also, the CBHE register was built for BPV6, which is SDNV, which has different encoding characteristics. So having uh, CCSDS, and I'm not pointing a finger at them for, for anything malicious, have a reservation of 100 to 254 in the CBHE version, um, service numbers, perfectly, perfectly valid. That is a huge chunk of the very precious numbers in BPV7, with, as far as I am aware, and I don't see into CCSDS documents, I can see no public specification for these. So I don't know what service number 191 in the CBHE registry is, and I, I can't implement it independently. That is not a criticism of CCSDS, because at the time they followed the policy exactly as described correctly, but with BPV7, with this slightly altered version and slightly different policy, it, transferring directly across does not make sense. Okay. I, I, um, thanks for the clarification, Rick. I just want to state a little bit of disagreement here, um, just based on the fact that, uh, you know, space applications are, uh, and, and SANA for that matter, uh, as a registry or an organization, are going to be mm -hmm. driving a lot of what gets standardized or de facto standardized by usage um, because of, uh, from the space agencies. So introducing breaking changes to me are, you know, um, it's, a, it's a huge deal uh, um, because yeah, so, at, at the end of the day, what we will be is incrementing costs of operations just by ensuring that, you know, service numbers means one here and two there. Um, I, I agree with the point that you made on, on the, their existing allocation might be too large, but that's something to discuss. You know, probably that we so, can discuss with them. Yeah. So I'm going to keep my answer quick. This is not a breaking change for two reasons. Uh, one, that allocate uh, that registry was for BPV6, and I know people said, "Oh, I'll just assume it keeps going for BPV7." That that is semantically incorrect, but it doesn't matter. But if you actually look at the allocation for private use of the one byte encoding, it covers that CCSDS allocation, so they can continue to use those numbers quite legitimately they're just now private and a different deployment by a different um a different deployment by a different operator may use those same numbers and ccsds need to be aware of that but i don't believe the existing <coughs> deployments by ccsds are designed to interoperate with other bpv7 deployments out there at the service level so it's a safe assumption i understand there is pain in change but we the change is necessary and we have attempted to minimize the impact. So, so just to jump in, uh, uh, two things, uh, a comment and then the time. Uh, the comment is if, if you look at the CBHE service registry for Miana, there is a single allocation uh, for CFTP. Yes. Uh, and if you look at the SANA uh, uh, allocation, which is uh, delegated from Miana, there are only two registrations, which are also for CFTP, uh, but using a different number uh, for the CFTP uh, sender and receiver. And I, I'm not sure if those are actually the operational service numbers being used for CFTP. So when, when we look at when we look at the actual number of service numbers and well-known services, there are three, and they are all CFTP. So we we think that the overall impact of this kind of change, uh, based on what is registered today, is small. But my second comment is we are out of, we are well past time on this. So uh, please let us take it to the mailing list uh, to continue the discussion. <laughs> take it to the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Sarah Heiner, who is going to be presenting on the uh, DTN uh, management architecture update. Sarah, are you are you here, and can you hear us? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Great. So like Ed said, I'm going to speak to some of the updates that have been made to the DTNMA since I last spoke at the 116 meeting. Next slide. So the DTNMA is now on version 6, and the updates that were made to the document are to reflect the comments that we received from some reviews. So thank you to folks who took that time, um, including the feedback from the ops area. Um, and these changes are clarifying 
they're not changing the architecture itself. They add clarification around uh, primarily decisions that were made when designing the DTNMA and they're focused primarily on the autonomy engine and the rules that we use for management. Next slide. So getting into those changes, um, first we made some updates to the discussion of the existing network management approaches. Uh, because the DTNMA is a new approach uh, to provide autonomy, asynchronous management, and address the need for concise encodings, we need to discuss what already exists, lessons learned from those approaches, what could be used from those approaches, and then where we do need to depart from those approaches to provide the combination of those three characteristics. So an example that I pulled onto the slide here was that we updated our SNMP overview to explain the use of event notifications. Their purpose is to decrease reaction time, not to provide autonomy, at least in um, SNMP. And that's something that the DTNMA requires. Next slide. We also made changes to hold the DTNMA to its intent to serve as just a architecture document. So any details that belong in the data and management model have been moved into, um, I believe, the application management model and operational data model, which is documented in the ADM draft that Brian's going to be speaking to next. Next slide. So now getting into the bulk of these updates, uh, we added some clarification around the DTNMA agent autonomy engine. We're now describing that as a policy execution engine, which was recommended so that we can emphasize the use of pre-shared policy in the form of rules, uh, which is received by the agent from the managing device. And also address what a manager can configure in that overall autonomy model. So we show the conceptual difference between the manager configuring the local rule database and then the configuration of the autonomy engine itself. So for example, a manager might be configuring the rule database by defining a new rule, uh, removing a rule, but then can configure the autonomy engine by enabling that rule as a part of the larger set to be executed. Next slide. Then to address the observation that using the term command-based management feels a bit general and could be interpreted multiple ways, uh, we're now using the term rule-based management, trying to be more specific here, but the behavior that was defined is still unchanged. So this is still a rule-based system that allows the agent to issue commands on itself for the purpose of both self-management using that local autonomy engine, and then also to execute commands received from remote managers. Next slide. We're also asked to consider the event condition action format for those autonomy rules. Since rules could be used to react to an event and adopting that format would allow rules to be grouped by events. So the approach that we took here was to expand the discussion of the capabilities provided by these autonomy rules. In all cases, the DTNMA is still remaining uh, that familiar stimulus response system where that rule definition includes the stimulus, which is built from one or more predicate logic expressions and then that pre-configured response, which defines the actual procedure that's being run when the stimulus occurs. But to bring in that beneficial grouping on events, 
we've added discussion around expanding capabilities within that rule stimulus. So the stimulus can include a common condition that's shared across rules. And there's an example in the lower blue box on my slide. Uh, and this is uh, allowing bulk evaluation of rules and it's also providing an important efficiency as rule sets start to grow. Next slide. So digging in a little bit further to potentially large rule sets, we also updated the language around the autonomy model characteristics and how they address the challenges of managing those large rule sets. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna run through a couple of these. So uh, first characteristic is strong typing. Second is acyclic dependencies. So we want to address the potential for those more complex rule stimuli uh, to uh, require combining predicates. If that occurs, we could be creating circular dependencies we need implementations to include a mechanism to prevent that from occurring so that we can have those more complex rule stimuli that allow us to group rules in that beneficial way. And then also an indication of if data is fresh is a key characteristic, and that's going to help prevent the agent from incorrectly inferring some sort of operational state out of that information that it is monitoring. And the next slide, which uh, is continuing with those characteristics, we've included some thoughts on the need for parameterization, and that's providing flexibility for specifying autonomy model objects while allowing less objects overall to be defined, which again helps with the management of those larger rule sets and then also speak to configurable cardinality and control-based updates as important characteristics with those control-based updates allowing uh, the state of the managed device to be changed um, using controls. And then last slide. So the last update to highlight is around conflict detection in rule sets. Since the DTNMA allows multiple managers to configure an agent, rule conflicts have to be both detected and prevented. So the DTNMA is now making the recommendation that implementations include a conflict resolution mechanism. And I've added a couple of the examples that we give um, a discussion of some of those potential options, like using time or some item in the managed state data to decide which manager input would be selected over another if a conflicting uh, rule set is identified. But we're not prescribing a single solution here. To continue with that trend of providing flexibility in the DTNMA wherever it's possible, so that we aren't creating a brittle management system and uh, levying some sort of constraint on the system that it doesn't need to necessarily accommodate. So with that, um, just wanna thank everyone again for their feedback, taking the time to read through the document um, and then formally request consideration for the DTNMA to move into working group last call. So we, we can we can handle the request for working group last call uh, on the mailing list. Uh, we will we will put that out. Uh, but now, uh, while we are here together, uh, does anyone have any concerns or observations on the work so far? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, we have uh, Brian Sipos who will be uh, covering three topics for us. Uh, the first one being 
the data model uh, that is uh, conformant to the management architecture uh, update. All right. So what I'd like to do is to cover um, all the major topics, give an overview of what's new, what's not new, and then uh, get comments and questions afterwards. So next slide, please. Uh, the uh, earlier drafts of this thing had called this uh, asynchronous management and, and had used some other names um, in between. And some of these names have carried over to implementations. Uh, and what the goal here is to keep as much of what already exists uh, in the same logical form and in some cases in the same um, form to implementations, focusing on keeping stability in the agents. And uh, the overall goal of the whole thing is to enable the, the management architecture of the DTN to be as uh, easy, straightforward to use as existing legacy management systems. So the, the goal of all of these updates and changes is to make it more familiar, uh, more expressive, and overall more difficult to uh, cause disruptions or cause problems in the managed agent. Next slide, please. So one big thing uh, in terms of usability and expressivity on the data model side of things uh, was to do with typing. The earlier uh, ADM typing was uh, quite narrow and specific and didn't allow an individual uh, application to tailor what uh, could be uh, specified in its ADM to its specific needs. And so there was a lot of rigidity and there was a lot of uh, forced narrowing of what you could do and then what that led to was uh, a fragility of the management tools because if uh, the only thing you can express in an ADM is that it's a, say, an integer, a 32-bit integer, uh, but in fact, there's a lot of restrictions on it or there's other metadata associated with it, uh, the manager tools wouldn't be aware of that and so couldn't enhance uh, what is shown to a user. It couldn't embellish the data with uh, restrictions or with units or with any kind of additional information. Uh, one other thing that was missing from the earlier data model was the concept of how to handle uh, failures in a way that's compatible with the whole architecture. And the concept here is that this is not a synchronous system. So uh, if I request a change or if I request a piece of information and the agent can't comply with that, uh, what do I do? So one of the type changes is to reuse uh, the notion of an undefined type. And undefined, we'll talk about it later, but it lives a little bit outside of the normal data model in that I can't say undefined is expected, but according to the, the model now, undefined is a thing that an agent can give you. If you ask for a thing and the agent can't produce it, uh, rather than failing with no uh, explanation, the agent will tell you, you asked for X, the value is undefined. So at least you can, uh, continue on with the normal processing. And then part of this is to strengthen rules for implicit and explicit type conversions and uh, create a way for the ADM to construct type unions and, and add lots of uh, embellishing metadata to, to these types so that it, this is something that an agent doesn't care about. An agent does what it does uh, with the data, but this is all to make the management side uh, easier. Uh, the processing models for macros, expressions, and, and report templates have been strengthened, uh, especially in the flow of uh, activities so that uh, if there are failures, exactly when failures are processed, how they're handled, and things like that, the, the processing model is, is um, stronger now than it was before. And this is something that right now it's a draft. Uh, we'd welcome uh, some trial implementations and feedback of existing implementations on this stuff because this isn't the right answer, but the idea is that it's a, a common and, and known processing model. Uh, what else here? The, um, uh, there was some feedback that came from uh, possible implementations of this thing that the autonomy capability was 
uh, in a sense, scaring people away from acting on the non-autonomy aspects of the uh, management architecture. And so we're separating the autonomy capabilities from the core of what it means to be the agent. And we'll talk about it later on, but it's done in a way that is part of the, the model itself. So it's a way for an agent to say, I support autonomy, use those controls on me versus an agent to be able to say, I don't support autonomy, um, you can't do that. And then uh, overall, the goal of this thing is to uh, simplify and where possible, minify the actual uh, messaging of things. So where the type is unambiguous, we provide a mechanism to elide type information. Where the type uh, needs to be there, then we make requirements about uh, where it belongs. So it's, it's strengthening up requirements and allowing some optimizations that in the past were possible but not uh, specified. Next slide, please. So some of these uh, slides I'm going to go pretty quickly through, and we can go back to them a bit later. But there were a bunch of types. There were a bunch of, because the, the previous type model was very rigid and fixed and hard uh, related to the uh, encoding of the values, there are a bunch of types that are highlighted in yellow here that aren't really types in terms of encoding, but they are types in terms of how you handle the data. And the new model is to separate those two things so that a literal type is about encoding and it's about processing and a semantic type is about how is the data handled separately so that uh, there can be interrelationships between the two, but uh, they are they're separate concepts. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these details on the slide, but the concept is that we're strengthening up the, the type hierarchy and we're using a notion that comes also from uh, Yang data modeling and other systems like that, where we have this notion of a type def, an application can define a type def, and one option of a type def is to define a, a union. So in the past where there were, there were need for some playing around with multiple forms of different operators to do the same kind of thing on different sort of data, now we can define a numeric type, which is a union of the values that can be numbers, and then we can define operators to say, uh, or, or controls that say this uh, uh, parameter is a numeric type and will explain how the operator or how the control differentiates on what it does on these different things. But the type system can now enforce the fact that numeric doesn't mean anything. It means one of these very specific um, primitive types. And similar things apply to the EDDs controls and uh, other uh, places where the types are used. Is it, It's strengthening up what is allowed to be in this value. And uh, the other thing that's that's supported by, eventually we'll talk about the syntax, is this notion of an anonymous type. It's It follows the same uh, definition model as Yang does currently, which is if you make a type def, it's great. You can reuse it, you can share it, but sometimes you just need to say, this parameter is an integer, but it's gotta be between five and, and eight. And an anonymous type lets you do that in a simplified way. Next slide, please. Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier, the difference between a literal type and a semantic type. Um, there's details on the slide, but the, the basic concept is at the bottom line of each of these things, which is a literal type is something that the agent cares about. It's something that affects data handling. It's something that implementations have to change. So the literal types are something that's tied to implementation. And semantic types are things that a person very much cares about and the manager would do well to care about, but the implementation of the agent doesn't need to really know or care about them. So the agent is gonna do what it's gonna do and it's gonna have its own logic of a value is supposed to be within a certain range or this can be text or this can be uh, a number. Uh, but the, the manager is the one that is, is um, enforcing this in a general purpose way so that we're not writing manager plugins for each application data model, the manager handles this data symmetrically across all ADMs. So the manager understands what a numeric range is, the manager understands what a text pattern is, uh, and things like that. Next slide, please. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, about undefined uh, earlier that uh, 
it's it's something that slots in with this pretty well because we're talking about using uh, CBOR and CBOR diagnostic notation to represent these things. So we get this basically for free by our encoding method, but we define semantics on this now that that explains to an agent when would you use this value and explains to a manager um, when must you handle this value. And then separate from the undefined uh, type and value is, again, because it's CBOR, we're getting this without extra handling cost, uh, a, a null type and a null value to allow us to express things like optionals. And we can get into, I can talk about details in specific ADMs, but the idea here is that some data models genuinely uh, have optional parameters or uh, reports can have optional contents. Whereas undefined is supposed to represent more of a failure and off normal situation, a null type that you can union in and say, it's a number or it's null. Uh, null is a positive indicator that I'm not giving you a value. It's, it's null. I'm not giving you the other thing. Uh, and also all of these uh, new notions of semantic types and all this stuff, it doesn't impose on any of the existing data models. It's something that in some cases can enhance or, or embellish what's already there, but none of what we're doing here is going to break somebody's logical data model. Uh, there might be some pointers to existing ADMs to say, well, would you want to use a type union in this place? Or would you want to put some units on these numbers that, that are valuable to know or put range restrictions, but we're not imposing these things on, on authors. Next slide, please. One thing that came up as a, a, an issue in understanding and in implementation of uh, earlier processing is to do with time types. And the earlier handling of time types was related to the type system itself. And so one of the changes here is to separate absolute times from relative times. These are now two completely separate uh, literal types. But in cases where a model would like to handle both of these things because there are cases where in the past models could accept either absolute time or relative time. The semantic type notion now lets us say for a specific piece of a specific model, this parameter can be a absolute time or a relative time. But what it uh, also allows is for certain places to say, you have to give me an absolute time. I don't, I can't process a relative time. I don't want to look at a relative time. So it allows us, similar to what I was talking about earlier, to, to nail down very specific aspects so that uh, a manager is going to be doing the right thing and can validate things for how an agent is going to handle things. And then the other change related to times is, uh, it's shown here in a, a CDDL expression, but we want the ability to have a, a compressible form of uh, narrow uh, precision times. In the past, time was handled with a, a least precision of one second. One second is good for some applications, but it's very limiting for other applications. So this says that time is something that uh, can use an existing, the, the fractional representation is something that's carried over. It was already part of uh, CBOR extended typing, and we're just reusing the same structure. Now, there's also uh, text representations of these things. So part of this enhancement, part of why these are uh, literal types is that as an embellishment on the management side, we want to not have to make people rely on external tools to do conversions between numeric times and um, human friendly text times. So these are part of the, the literal types so that the tools themselves know what a time is and know how to uh, reference it against a specific epoch. And uh, there's a note at the bottom that <clears throat> the fact that there's now uh, fine grained precision of time means that there's value in having a, an agent be able to expose um, its notion of what kind of time precision can it handle. The, the concept here is that I can always represent my times down to, a, a, in this case, a nanosecond resolution, that doesn't mean an agent is going to be able to enforce rules at a nanosecond time, or they're going to be able to um, 
act on them in other ways down to that precision, but they have to handle them down to the nanosecond. Next slide, please. Uh, the next few slides are going to talk details about processing, but generally the idea is that we're nailing down specifics that in the past were not fully specified. And what that meant was that different agents were free to do things in different ways. Uh, and in a normal situation, that wouldn't make a difference. But this is talking about, uh, say, in a macro execution, if one uh, control or one aspect of the macro fails, how is an agent supposed to handle that? Is it supposed to stop? Is it supposed to continue? So now that all is specified. And this is something that's open to discussion. There's an explicit specification here. Uh, it's not a right answer, but it is a concrete answer. And then there's also some requirements about what an agent is allowed to do to say things like, to, for a manager's point of view, if you tell me certain things in certain ways, am I allowed to do <coughs> things in parallel or do I have to do things in sequence? Um, those are all now specified. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, expressions are handled similarly, that um, there's now a staged processing expressions so that uh, if there are references in expression, those get handled first. So we don't get halfway through processing expression to find an invalid reference, things like that. And the expressions are now strongly typed. So in the past, there was a specification that said, your expression ought to have these things in it, only these things. Now, with the semantic type syntax, there's a way to say, enforced in the machine, an expression is a very specific thing. And the machine will tell you uh, on the manager side, did you try to do something that you should not be allowed to do versus letting it go all the way to the agent only for the agent to fail out? Uh, next slide, please. And there's similar updates to the report template processing uh, for the same thing is that report templates have to have specific content that's now enforceable through semantic types on the manager side as well as on the agent side. And uh, there's a change of how this thing is processed so that a, a report template now is not a separate top level object type. A report template is a piece of data that if you put it in an EDD, it functions the same as it used to, but you can also put a report template in a variable uh, and you can also put a report template in um, any other place where uh, uh, the semantic uh, type value will go. And we pulled together the report and the table so that the concept is that it's more, it's fewer top level object types, so it simplifies the data model, but it allows expressive expressiveness that uh, we restrict where these things ought to be used in certain ways, but it lets an application potentially do some interesting things that uh, might not be advised, but it lets the application figure out what is best for its own purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, and then separate from the handling of those different types, uh, we put concrete requirements and value production. There's a whole section in the document about this to say consts, uh, variables, and, and external defined data, EDDs, um, they have common characteristics. They have common processing. There's a certain order of things. Uh, if you give it a bad object name, if you give it a bad parameter, they're handled in similar ways and in concrete ways now. And uh, what this part of this change is to allow uh, parameters under certain circumstances for constants and variables uh, that are handled uh, to allow uh, report templates and expressions and macros to be themselves parameterized. So it's, it's simplifying the object model, but expanding the expressivity of what can be in the object model. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but separating autonomy from core behavior uh, in the data model itself means that I can implement an agent uh, without autonomy in a way that doesn't have any uh, time-based processing at all. So I can build a completely deterministic uh, agent, a very, very simple agent that doesn't know or care about time per se, but it implements the full notion of what it means to be a DTNMA agent. And uh, I think that's 
has a lot of power to it because there are certain circumstances where we want to be able to exercise the full autonomy model, but there's other circumstances where in a constrained system, I want to be able to talk to it with a standard protocol. And this gives us the ability to do that without requiring even a, a real notion of a clock on the agent and things like reports can be produced uh, on a fixed uh, relative timer uh, that has nothing to do with autonomy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through these next ones too, that what this allows is uh, as part of the, the ARI changes, it also allows things to be uh, more uh, condensed in terms of the messaging. Um, we're keeping the concept of messages, message groups, and all this stuff, but it's now reduced to an execution message that goes from manager to agent and a report message that goes from agent to manager. And there's complexity in those messages, but it's, it's simplified things down uh, significantly from how it was before. Uh, and reports now, as previously defined, uh, contain a bunch of different information uh, it serves different purposes, but it's all the same format. And this is similar to what was done with the, the typing system between the, the literal types and semantic types is we want the encoding to be as simple as possible, but we want the applications to allow to use this to do complex things. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing that still needs to have uh, a wider review uh, is that we're now encoding uh, ADMs as a profile of Yang modeling language. So the way this operates is that we inherit a bunch of really useful behavior from Yang. We inherit the contents of uh, modules and submodules and revision history, uh, prefixes and imports, features for doing conditional uh, implementations, all of the lifecycle things related to status and references and descriptions. Uh, we want to reuse those things. And we want people who are familiar with Yang to be able to understand what's happening here. But then we're prohibiting and replacing other uh, existing Yang behavior in a way that does not change the syntax of Yang. This is all within the letter of the law of a Yang module. So we are not using um, constructs which are specifically associated with NetConf. We're not using actions, notifications, and RPCs. We're not using isolated data nodes uh, or the concept of data stores. And because of this, we're saying this is a separate ecosystem of Yang modules. We're using the syntax, but we're never going to import a legacy Yang model into an ADM module, and we're never going to import from an ADM module into a Yang, uh, legacy Yang module. So because they're separate ecosystems, then we are not, we're not concerned about um, the people who are managing the existing Yang ecosystem uh, do not need to be worried that this is going to start causing conflicts and causing confusions. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as part of inheriting the Yang uh, syntax, we're also talking about inheriting uh, some uh, processing and semantics of Yang of how are uh, modules allowed to be implemented on agents, how are modules allowed to change across revisions, uh, and there's actually some interesting work currently uh, going through uh, in the NetMod group that clarifies and puts versions and compatibility information into Yang modules. And uh, we would love to take advantage of all that stuff. Anything that's to do with the module level uh, processing, uh, we can reuse wholesale and get good benefit out of it. Next slide, please. And then before we go, we, we do have Lou in the queue. Hi. Hi, Lou Berger. Um, I was I'm a little confused by these two slides of what you are, what you're trying to avoid with um, not taking Yang wholesale. And it sounds to me that you're actually saying you don't want to use Yang transport mechanisms or encodings, but Yang is okay. And but you also said you want to like not bring along baggage of Yang. And I I, I so. I don't know if you're going to talk about that more a little bit or talk about why, you know, what, what you're tr really trying to accomplish. I, I get actually the transport and encoding thing, wanting something completely separate from NetConf, RESTConf, mm -hmm. maybe CBOR, maybe GNMI, 
you know, there's a lot of things out there, but you want another one? Okay. Um, but uh, as soon as you start throwing away other parts of the language, you lose the benefit of reuse of tooling. And it yes. means you have to get all your own tooling. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. If you want to take it to the list, that's okay too. Yeah, well, I'll say briefly that uh, what we're doing does not give you incompatibility of tooling, but what it does is, as you said, means that there are existing secondary behaviors that you can do on Yang modules, like produce a, a, a object tree or produce you know information about the module. That if you run those on these modules, you're not going to get anything. It's not going to break the tools, but like you said, it's not the same use cases for those tools. I think I need to go read more because I don't understand why. But okay. that's okay. And the, the, the fundamental thing is we, we need a syntax for these ADM modules. We need a syntax that uh, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel of how do you create structured text, right? Uh, identifier names, curly brackets, nested uh, definition structure. We, we could have, and in the past did with a JSON structure, define fully what is a custom encoding of an ADM. The goal here is to say, we don't want to reinvent a, a text formatting syntax. Yang is great. And we don't want to reinvent how to version a, a module. Yang already defines that and does it well. We don't want to reinvent uh, the concept of metadata and uh, mm -hmm. documentation, internal documentation and um, uh, import revision uh, you know, cross-references. We don't want to reinvent all that stuff. We want to use both the syntax and the semantics. Someone who's familiar with dealing with Yang and NetConf can use this uh, directly. It's using the same syntax and the semantics. What we're saying is we don't have um, any of the things that are tied to NetConf, which are the data node definitions, the RPCs, and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I, Yang, NetConf isn't really one word. There's Yang, <laughs> and then there's NetConf, and they do not need to be linked at all. And yes, historically, in the you know, the early days of Yang, they were completely linked. When I say, today, yeah. Today, when, today they're not. And uh, personally, I never want to use NetConf, um, but I do want to use Yang. When I say NetConf, what I mean is something that is structured in a, a hierarchical way that's representable in the way that NetConf RESTConf represents it. We don't, we're not representing those objects. We don't handling those semantics and we're not using those, uh, those syntax. But it's a legal thing to do from the perspective of our modules will validate Yang linters. So we'll talk so about what, it later. What but don't you want from Yang? And the, I'm not saying what don't the, you want the, from NetConf. I'm saying what don't you want from what are you not bringing on? And chairs, if you say this is too much of a rat hole, I accept that. We don't we don't model and structure data uh, the same way as before. And one of the fundamental I mentioned it at the beginning, but one of the fundamental things of all of these changes is that these changes don't affect the ADM uh, or the AMP agents. The agents have constructs called controls and EDDs, and variables, consts. None of this at all affects what is fundamental to the DTNMA and the agents. So in order to keep those constructs, to keep those structures, that's why there's a disconnect between. So, so to, get offline, that's great, thank you. So, so again, I, again, it, it would be good to have uh, these kind of conversations uh, also on the mailing list. Uh, there, we have had a couple of discussions uh, related with some Yang experts, and the, the real question is, to what extent does this represent a, a domain-specific language that we're trying to map, and whether it's better to have metadata for modules and then the rest be a hard cutoff to a domain specific language versus trying to intermix some things that we take and some things that we do not because that may cause more confusion uh, in how we would be building modules. But, but that, if, if you have some time after the working group, it would be a good sidebar conversation and then something that we should represent on the mailing list. Thank you. Yep. So if you skip ahead to... And, and then it just in the interest of time, we'll, we can add maybe another 10 minutes for the, the remainder. Yeah, we well, uh, skip it. We can skip this talking about Yang, Yang and ADM specific details. Next slide. 
life cycles annotations. The whole point is that Yang and the Yang ecosystem do things very well and have evolved over time to do things in a way that people are familiar with and to do things that people need to do. And so the original goal was, boy, these are very useful constructs. We want these constructs. And when we looked at it a little further was, why don't we also use the syntax and not just the constructs? Because we don't want to have to fully reinvent tooling for these things. So next slide, please. Uh, I think this is the end, but the idea is that uh, there still are some open issues and things that are worth discussing um, related to what belongs in an agent core ADM. Uh, are things, uh, should additional things go in there? Uh, should things be split out separately? Uh, things like that. Um, the, the in ADM typing still needs to be worked out. This was something that we, the current draft carries over this notion of typing and, and uh, grouping syntax from Yang, but because Yang is based on modeling a two level structure where leaf types are one thing and complex uh, types are another thing, uh, but that's not how the ADMs are structured. That's not how the type system works. And so going forward, probably what's gonna happen is we're, we're not gonna try to reuse any of the syntax of the um, typing. So nobody will be confused about what is a, a, a leaf or a list in the context of an ADM. We're not going to use that syntax. We're going to use different syntax that's specific to uh, ADMs. And then uh, part of the, what needs to be worked out is just terminology. Uh, reports now kind of represent, there's a message related to reporting. There's a content of a message related to reporting. There's an entry and there's an activity called reporting. And they, they represent different things. And maybe we need some more detailed terminology to differentiate these things. Uh, right now, what's in there should be consistent and complete. But reading through there, it could be confusing. And we want to avoid confusion. And uh, the one other thing that is, is not been updated so far is a concrete representation, meaning uh, a, a, a protocol that is actually used between the agent and the manager. It was touched upon earlier. And there is, there's this notion that it's simple that there are reports that go one way and there's execution that goes the other way, but it's not been written down. Uh, and it, it, it's something that needs to be written down just so that it's a realizable thing. But the idea is that all of these other things are in support of making the notion of what is a report message and what is an execution message to be ultimately a collection of ARIs. That's the goal of all this thing is that the ARI syntax is the fundamental thing that's about the exchange of information and the configuration of things. So ARIs are something that a human looks at. ARIs are the thing that a machine handles. And I believe that's the last slide. Oh, I just talked about the ARIs. Uh, so just document editing is one thing that needs to happen now and uh, giving feedback on the contents as they are. Uh, the simplified uh, management model, the simplified um, ADM object model. Uh, one step is to translate existing ADMs into Yang modules. This is something that could be done relatively mechanically, uh, but it's a question of is, is it worth trying to automate some of this stuff uh, or just copy and paste text. And then the other thing is a trial implementation. Um, we have existing uh, agent implementations uh, one of them comes out of the NASA ION project, and uh, there are some others that are in, in use or in development currently. But we'd like to um, take some of these tools and make these extensions and see, see how it works in practice. The goal of all of these changes to the ARIs, to the ADMs and all that, is to simplify. The goal is to make it so that it's less error prone to the implementation, it's less error prone to somebody using it, it's less error prone to somebody trying to diagnose things. That's overall what, what these changes represent. And I think that's the end, okay. I, I will simply just also add, uh, please, if you've not looked through this update, it is a large and beneficial update uh, and, and large, uh, perhaps 90 pages large. The actual like. changes <laughs> are a significant portion of the document, yeah. but the, the content is to add specification where 
it was loose or missing before. Yes, but so, so critical technical review and commentary on the mailing list is requested. And now uh, to talk uh, again about COSI, uh, yep. Brian Sipos. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so at the previous working group, uh, the COSI context was adopted as a, a working group draft. Um, and the idea is that we are building on existing work in the default security context, uh, which was very narrow and focused on symmetric key encryption for that specific purpose of having a context that's simple and uh, directly usable. Uh, but it's limited in the sense that we are not in any way able to operate in a PKI uh, security environment right now in a standard way. And so the idea here is that, and this was something that was uh, indicated by the, the sector when reviewing the BPSEC originally that you need somehow to operate in a PKI environment because that's what the world uses. And because we don't want to reinvent the wheel here, the COSE working group already defines a message format that is made for uh, this kind of uh, isolated asynchronous form of, of uh, messaging. So what this does is it, it uses COSE directly. It just says, uh, COSE defines all these details about how to build and process uh, security messages, and we put them into a, a security context. Next slide, please. Uh, and what this uh, does is uh, it provides a profile of COSE to say, how do you interoperate this? It provides uh, an embedding of COSE to say, where do these things belong in the BPSEC environment? And uh, this um, now uh, is something that is should be directly implementable in a, a BPSEC uh, uh, agent. And the last changes to the draft were to expand the notion of uh, AAD scope, the additional authenticated data originally. And in the default security context, there was a notion of AAD could be the bundled primary block which is its identity and uh, the uh, metadata about the block containing the thing that you're integrity signing or encrypting. Uh, that's expanded now so that AAD scope can, can be uh, any other block in the bundle. So this can do something like, for example, I can sign my um, payload, but say, also I'm including these three other blocks that have to travel with the payload. If you touch these three other blocks, the payload will fail to verify. So it's it's enabling, and it's through a single signature or single Mac operation. So it enables this more expressive uh, content. And it's necessary uh, in certain use cases where you're doing things like uh, encrypting the payload, but requiring uh, additional blocks to be able to interpret the payload. Uh, right now, the, the document is uh, pending last call. Uh, still looking for some any feedback that anybody has. This has been requested uh, to be reviewed by the COSE working group on the mailing list, and we have gotten some feedback, uh, but none of it is to do with uh, changes in the document itself. Um, and so right now it's, it's in a stable state. Next slide. So uh, we talked about the motivations before. Uh, this um, this document doesn't address policy related to BPSEC, just generally. Um, so in a PKI environment, there are a lot of additional policy considerations. We talked about some of them in, in the security portion of the document, but um, it's really up to implementations to uh, to define simple or complex policies that are, that are needed in those situations. And Brian, did you have additional slides for EID patterns? No, there's no additional slides. Okay. So may, maybe in the interest of time, we stop here, and then we can take EID patterns for yeah. additional uh, comments, unless there's any no. comments. The, the, the other uh, sort of question, again, back to the working group, is this document is in working group last call. So while we are here, uh, for those who have read the document, are there any questions or concerns uh, with the document now, because otherwise it is going to go through uh, working group last call uh, successfully unless we see something brought up here or on the mailing list. Okay.
right. Thank you very much. And thank you, Brian. Yep. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Mark Blanchet, who is going to be uh, talking about the uh, bundle protocol uh, Yang model. Good morning for those local. Um, next slide. Um, the rationale of uh, this work is to uh, be able to manage BP nodes uh, using uh, network management protocols such as NetConf and ResConf, for example. Uh, use cases are, for example, IP networks uh, are deployed on planetary bodies and moon, for example. You could see the various uh, space agencies architecture documents. Some of those uh, BP nodes will be dual stack and not V4, V6 uh, as we know typically, but instead uh, BP and IP. So they could be managed I over IP locally. Um, BP only nodes, uh, so not on an IP network, uh, can be managed also using RESCONF uh, over HTTP over BP. Uh, in that context, you don't need an, an IP stack, just an I HTTP listener or parser on the bundled agent as a service. Uh, the good part of this is you uh, enable reuse of all network management tools and can be augmented with uh, any Yang work that is being done. For example, contact plans that will be discussed to, uh, tomorrow at the TVR uh, working group uh, meeting. And it's pretty complementary to DTMA, not competitive or in any way. Next slide. Um, so the way we did it is to actually look at the data structures of uh, some implementation and try to do everybody and try to be as close as possible, but uh, while remaining generic. And it's currently uh, that design or that Yang model is actually augmented by the contact plan. You could see the drafts are cited there will be discussed tomorrow. Next slide. So that's the three view. I'm not going to all uh, everything here. Um, pretty straightforward. So a node as a version endpoint and identifier, as uh, you know the various uh, um, properties of a bundle node as neighbors, neighbors uh, with their convergence layers, adapters, uh, identifiers, and uh, transport. Um, this is currently not fully complete, but you know you actually get the structure and will be completed as as we go. Um, you have read write uh, and read only. Um, read only is mostly querying the current state, and read write is to actually uh, you know change the state. Next slide. I think we have on the next one. Yeah, the. Uh, itself, the convergence uh, layer adapters on the, the bundle node itself, and then the storage. Um, and then within the storage, there are bundles. Uh, right now, they are read-write, but you know we'll look into uh, comments, but probably not the right thing to do. Um, but that's very easy to change. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, next slide. Um, I got uh, Felix Walter um, uh, as an early reviewer. A um, few considerations. If a node supports V6, uh, BP6 and BP7, should it appear as a single node with two versions or two virtual nodes on one supporting each, uh, each version? Or we don't care about BP6. <laughs> I was thinking of a single node with multiple versions. Um, it's not currently yet reflected in the draft. Um, comments, please. Um, a neighbor as a single CLA or may have multiple CLAs uh, currently modeled as a, as a uh, so it could be modeled as multiple neighbors or a neighbor with multiple CLAs. Uh, right now, I said so that actually was a comment from uh, Felix and modeled with a single neighbor with multiple CLAs. And I think that's the next, the last slide. Next slide. Yeah, so looking for working group adoption and comments. 
So, so this is Ed with uh, chair hat off. Uh, there had been some additional work on defining managed information for bundle protocol. I, I believe Ohio University had published a B bundle protocol MIB for BPv6. And I think that there is a um, uh, older uh, BP ADM also probably per, per bundle protocol version six. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, Ed says there's an EDM for BP6. I've asked Ed, <laughs> where are those EDM and never uh, get them. <laughs> oh, I, I can put the link in the chat. But the, um, but the question is for maybe for the, for the other MIB, uh, did you have a chance, is there a significant, uh, is there information in the prior work that is omitted in this work? Uh, I, I don't know. I was looking for that kind of okay. information. So please provide, uh, you know. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll provide sure. links of the, especially the MIB. I, I was looking for that information. But, the, the other is a, with chair head on, uh, for a working group adoption, we will post to the mailing list uh, the, the uh, request for adoption. But while we are here, uh, are there any uh, uh, questions, concerns, or comments on adopting uh, a bundle protocol seven Yang module in the working group? Okay. Right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, we'll have Eric, who will be talking through uh, BP over Ethernet. Hello, I'm Eric Klein. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, Ethernet uh, CLA, or just BPOE is what I called it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so. In some uh, in some network architecture work I was doing, I had a situation where I had uh, bundle protocol agents that were directly connected over an Ethernet link, uh, and in some situations uh, over things that basically emulate a virtual link, some virtual private cloud stuff, certain types of RF links, uh, and also uh, the more I thought about it, the more everything eventually grows to support Ethernet at some point or look like it anyway. And it seemed to me that I, if I was going to be okay with uh, a datagram CLA that I didn't need to have IP and UDP in there. Uh, some TCP might be necessary, but I thought I would save that for later. In some of these environments, MTU might not be a concern. It's kind of a function of the workload, but also you know, jumbo frames are a thing, and uh, some links have uh, sub-link layer fragmentation reassembly that they do that they support for their uh, Ethernet payload emulation. Uh, next slide, please. So the proposal was to just put bundles in Ethernet frames. Uh, and I thought, well, we just need a dedicated Ethernet type and uh, some text around how to multiplex uh, v6 and v7. And that is basically what the draft there uh, zero, 00 says. Um, with respect to Ethernet types, I did a little bit of uh, searching to try to find out whether or not anything had been actually reserved. I found some DTN uh, code bases doing some ethernet things with ether types that were not in the IEEE registry, near as I could tell. Uh, that being said, the ETF has a uh, established process with the IEEE RFC 7042, and it's currently undergoing this. Uh, and I mean, the short version is that we basically need to have a protocol that advances to the IESG telechat. Uh, and as soon as things get to that level, then uh, discussions happen between uh, the two bodies. Uh, with, uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are some considerations here. Uh, it, I think the more I thought about it, the more there's basically, uh, and certainly it was okay for my use case, but a single sender agent and a single receiver agent, because it's basically source Mac to desk Mac. Uh, either that, or if you have multiple sort of agents that can all open uh, sock adder LL, uh, then uh, they all have to sort of be okay with receiving everything and figuring out what to discard. Uh, I don't know if there's some if additional source desk discriminators like port numbers would be required. That would necessitate some header. I don't think that's necessary. There, uh, uh, in a conversation I had with uh, someone, there was a, a recommendation that MTU could still be a factor, and maybe there should be some built-in level of fragmentation. It would certainly be very easy for me to copy. Uh, IPv4, IPv6 fragment header text. That's an established uh, thing. Uh, it works whenever the network allows it to work, which is a separate conversation. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, you know, a question of like extensibility uh, in general. I know uh, 
I had some discussions with Brian, and uh, he mentioned that maybe uh, a thing to do would be to pull out uh, the multiplexing text since 7166 uh, was never updated uh, for BPV7. This hasn't really been discussed uh, or in a document that was uh, published. So uh, I think maybe that's a thing that we could do uh, and we could save extensibility uh, for that document. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is an individual draft. Uh, and I guess the question is, is any of this worth pursuing? Uh, and if so, how fancy should we try to get? Sometimes simple is best. Sometimes simple is too simple. So uh, it's Rick with chair hat off. Um, I really like this work. I think it's obvious that, that there are use cases for this. Um, you made a comment about MTU and using bundle protocol fragmentation. I think it would be better if the CL itself did some fragmentation and reassembly rather than that duplication of primary uh, primary block, as you correctly point out. I think, and this goes back to a conversation that I know you and Brian have been having and I've been quietly supporting as well. I think there are commonalities for convergence layers, not only in the, in the interface they supply to the bundle protocol agent, but also in roles and responsibilities, particularly for unreliable underlying transports, such as some kind of fragmentation and reassembly should occur in the CL, in my opinion. Um, and it would be great if that was described somewhere, but actually also implemented for, for the CL. But I, I like it, and I really support this. Um, Scott Burley, uh, uh, two things. One is, I, I think a long time ago, uh, a prototype uh, implementation for um, an Ethernet uh, convergence layer adapter was developed, and that'd be a thing to look up and see if there's anything useful in it. Um, the other is that is uh, I think it could be uh, um, it, it could be helpful to uh, harmonize this work with. Um, the CCSDS link layer protocol convergence layer adapters, because there there may be uh, things that link layer um, CLAs have in common that would be um, good cross checks against one another, and um, and possibly inform one another. In particular, I know that there is uh, uh, a, um, a segmentation and reassembly functionality in the CCSDS stack. I'm not sure where it, whether it's in packets or in frames, but it, but it may very well be in frames, in which case it, it could be uh, something to harmonize this work with. Is that, is that using LTP, or is there a separate um, the blue book or green book number? Uh, no, there are separate uh, books for, for the CCSDS uh, link layer protocols. Uh, uh, probably the best one to work with would be something called USLP, um, USLP. Unified, uh, Space Link Protocol, it is. Um, and then there's a, there, there are CCSDS blue books for that. Um, and, and I think that'd be, you know, worth being aware of anyway. Okay. So addendum to that chair hat on, Rick Taylor. Um, if somebody was to put forwards a informational document capturing, you know, what's current best practice, what current behavior, I would absolutely support its adoption. I think that that is would fit into the charter. Lou, Lou Berger, uh, I'd like to explore or understand a little bit more of the use case where this is needed. Um, you started talking about adding in transport protocol, but you know the the whole purpose of what you're saying is let's get rid of the transport protocol because we don't need it. So it seemed a little circular to me there. And 24, 28 bytes doesn't seem like a whole lot of overhead. Um, so you know, what's the use case here? Uh, it's not a whole lot of overhead, but you have to manage and allocate the uh, uh, IP addresses on both sides, communicate to, to that to both endpoints. Uh, and uh, the uh, use case was uh, essentially if you just wanted to uh, broadcast some things on a, on an uh, isotropic omnidirectional antenna. Just broadcast messages uh, to all receivers as a for use as, as a control plane protocol, or send it point to point link over some RFF some RF links uh, between orbiting things. Uh, and if you just 
if the control plane just needed to say, this is the MAC address of the other guy and not worry about having IP addresses. I mean, even, even link local addresses would work, but it seemed like kind of like why bother, especially, especially if I was gonna do datagram stuff, but I didn't mean to add a whole transport protocol, just the sort of fragmentation part. TCP gives you all the retry stuff and all the SAS. None of that is, is, is anywhere in any of this BPOE at the moment. Uh, UDP gives you fragmentation reassembly also. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a high cost. Link local, you, yeah, you use more bits with V6, but it's still but you need more isn't too expensive. Um, yeah, I don't I, I'm, That means your link has to support IP as well. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't hear the last thing. That, does, that means your link has to support IP as well. And I think everything that I have to worry about uh, does. So it's not really an issue, but. Sure. I mean, well, you know, the underlying, if, if, you, could, if you support Ethernet, you support IP. And yeah, you don't want to make your underlying Ooh. network IP aware. Just leave it at Ethernet aware. Yeah. <laughs> Just put IP on the endpoints, and then you don't have to do all this extra standardization and then all the tooling related to it. Just get it for free. I mean, if, if there's a use case where it's too expensive, oh, okay. Uh, that that I it in theory, sure. I mean, there's plenty of use cases where things get expensive, but is that real here? Is it worth? You know, is it worth doing all this? It seems simple enough to me to not worry about, it, uh, but yeah, all right. <laughs> and Brian. Uh, I do agree with the earlier comments about fragmentation is a valuable thing to have in the convergence layer and it's worth looking into. And the, the other thing about separating the BP V6 and V7 processing, it relates back to some of the things that Mark was looking at is right now there isn't really a strong model of what does a dual stack node look like? Is it two nodes? Is it one node? So that would avoid, you know, cluttering up their tra your, your transport concern with your, you know, multiplexing yeah. concern. Yeah, I think, I'll, yeah, I, I had started a document at your recommendation to pull a bunch of that stuff out, put that in there. Uh, and then this could be in theory, just a document that requests an ether type at that point, which should be a one pager. And, and one more uh, from Felix. Felix can just, um, yeah, Scott comment on uh, the CCSDS uh, protocols got me thinking. So actually the fragmentation is what you have the packet layers below, either in the space packets or the encapsulation packets. So I'm wondering because fragmentation for me in the network on bundle la layers really, really bad because once you have fragmentation, there's all these fragments traveling all along the, the network. So I was wondering if there is maybe an option or a need for having a kind of generic fragmentation or layer and convergence there, which can run on top of several frame layer protocols, like the space link protocols, but also things like Ethernet or using GFP uh, framing procedures or things like that, so that we could have a kind of really generic uh, fragmentation within the convergence layer adapter itself. I think this would make, seems to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, do you mean that uh, like uh, selective acknowledgements and retransmit also needs to be uh, part of things? It was sounded, sounded to me like maybe you were trying to get LTP. Because it might be covered by things like LTP already. I missed that. I think the idea was to try and do generic reliability on top of framing CLs, so have a bit of stack mm. thing. We, we do have two more comments. I've, I've locked the queue just in the interest of time because we do have two more topics to get to, but Rick and then Scott. So Rick, very quickly, uh, chair hat off. Um, one of the reasons, Lou, one of the reasons I support this is with if you're going straight to ethernet from bp and this is a bizarre thing to say at the ietf you don't need an ip stack that's less code that's less you have to validate you can go straight from bp to ethernet and, and back up again um, yeah this is scott I, um uh, the uh, idea of a um, sort of generic uh, multi-link layer fragmentation reassembly layer has um, some appeal. I think that, that it could be useful. And I think that um, as uh, Felix was mentioning, the, the CCSDS um, um, encapsulation packets or, or, or space packets, one or the other, 
uh, do that uh, now and might be a good model. If somebody has a, a CCSCS, uh, red book, blue book, green book, 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 whatever number, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, for our final two topics, uh, these were more uh, working group uh, discussion topics. One of them is uh, going over, let's see, where is it? Uh, applications over BP. And then the other one is a, a governance discussion around allocator IDs. So for, for this one, uh, we have a, a single slide that we wanted to talk through. Uh, we have two uh, independent uh, drafts uh, that have come up on how to place application traffic over bundle, uh, one for SMTP, uh, the other for HTTP. Uh, these talk about how you can construct a payload so that a payload uh, that endpoints would be able to operate in a delayed or disrupted environment uh, in which the payload would then be presumed to be carried over bundle protocol but otherwise it is a construction of a payload to be carried over bundle protocol. Uh, there are working implementations uh, to demonstrate that, that the approach uh, exists. And then there was a mailing list uh, adoption call to say whether we would, as a working group, adopt uh, each of these drafts and publish them within the, the DTNWG. Uh, there was support uh, for the drafts because uh, finding a way to use both mail and HTTP traffic uh, in a delayed and disrupted environment is a is a useful thing and we would like bundle to be used more. Uh, and in particular, uh, there is a lot of support for anything that allows us to have more application traffic running over bundles. There was a question on uh, whether this falls within the scope of the DTN working group uh, because it is not specific to bundle or transport. It is the creation of payloads to be uh, sent over a transport. And then there were additional questions as to whether uh, the technical approach was uh, sort of the, the favored approach because it doesn't um, pull data out of the payload and put it into extension blocks or otherwise use elements of the bundle protocol itself. Uh, so in that, through, through a variety of discussions, uh, two things came up. Uh, one was there's probably a value in an informational document that says if you are writing applications to send in a delayed or disrupted environment or generally a bundle protocol environment, these are things you should worry about and things that you should do in your application layer. Uh, and separately, here are approaches uh, that could be used for things like mail and HTTP. So uh, in this section, uh, my hope is that we could have a, a discussion uh, or at the very least some questions uh, to the working group, either online or, or at the mic. The first one is, uh, is there uh, interest and support in an informational document that would describe application layer concerns when writing and using and transporting over bundles in a delayed or disrupted environment. I see Mark, their hand up. Uh, not much a troublemaker. <laughs> or trying to have applications on bundle. Um, applications, consideration, promotional document. Um, uh, Jorge, uh, myself, and uh, Brian, we had an email conversation that started. I wrote something along those lines a while ago called application framework. Um, so I do agree we should have someone something about that. I could start one with my uh, if Jorge still, you know, have some time, it seems that it's uh, uh, more difficult nowadays with his new position. But anyway, uh, yeah, I agree. We should have something about that. Uh, is that prior, during, or after the other two is a, an interesting question. You know, we, you know, there's pros and cons on on getting that after we we have actually worked on real stuff, so you get lesson learns. I fear a bit that if we do start too early, we're, we'll be kind of a generic, boring stuff. A yeah. Bit. yeah, yeah. Oh. Indeed. No, thank you. Uh, Eric? Uh, Eric Klein, uh, AD hat off. Yeah, I agree with everything uh, Mark said. I think we should do an application document. It would be good to also have some experience 
in, informing that document, um, but with like a generic IESG head on, not AD for your group, like uh, trying to specify SMTP and HTTP, somebody might ask about charter and scope and things like that. So that could be, unless, so, unless you've already talked to some art ADs. So Rick Taylor chair hat on responding. Um, Absolutely consider an application considerations document to be in charter. I think it's an important thing for us to do to say how to use our transport well. 100%. If in order to, as Mark pointed out, to make sure that document actually has uh, value and has been built on some sort of experience of trying to do this properly, we may generate the SMTP and the HTTP document documents as a side effect of getting that main one right and then if we have that document we can then go argue with the IESG about where we actually finish it off but at least we have valuable information as text so then it's a semantic discussion those also don't necessarily have to be adopted documents uh, thank you i think you're uh, scott Uh, yeah, uh, Scott Burley, and I'm just um, speaking in support of the idea of having this document. I, I think that uh, we already have examples of uh, applications. There's bundle protocol applications that are being specified within this uh, working group. So it certainly makes sense for me to have um, um, something that documents uh, general principles for developing those applications. Thank you. Brian? Uh, I agree with the previous statements and also uh, related to specifically the HTTP and the email transport. Uh, doing things in BP means that there's the possibility of using extension blocks and combining that with BPSEC and solving problems in a much cleaner way than in the past some of the other groups have tried to deal with partial header security in HTTP or uh, different combinations of SMIME in, in an email world. But without relying on that baggage, being able to do things with, with BPSEC uh, and clean and, and ways that are not necessarily limited to these two applications. Thank you, Brian. Alberto? For the, for the chairs, um, and it has to do with, um, you know, I, I support the, you know, the importance of, you know, continue, um, investigating and defining how applications would could be you know um, get through the network and the question is more about the charter and the priorities um, you know um, um, we you know we we are working with that charter with very you know um, delineated priorities and there are a list of items that are also very important but didn't make it to the charter so I'm trying to understand what are we deciding here whether it is you know, a topic that we should consider or whether this is a topic that we would prioritize as a charter? Yeah, so so Rick with chair hat on responding. Um, the working group is open to uh, people working on items within the scope of the charter really in the priority defined by those who have the bandwidth to do the work. So it's, it's very not it's not a work schedule. It's a, this is the, the outer limits of what we consider reasonable to do as a working group over the forthcoming two, three, four years, hopefully three, the ISG like us to keep it fairly well scoped. So the charter is a tool to make sure we don't wander off and do random work uh, out of scope. It's not a, first we do this, then we do this. Um, we're not that corporate. So from following on from that, my perspective is I would love to see a, a general application considerations for how to take your existing application or develop your new application for BP, as long as there are people willing to put the work in. Because I think we can all sit here and nod sagely and say, this would be lovely. But if at IETF 121, it still doesn't exist, it's just, yeah. Are there people willing to work on this is my question. So, and, and then again, in the interest of time, so we do have one more topic uh, that we want uh, to get to that is important. That the, the last uh, question, so what we're hearing based on the comments is that there is, is general support for an informational document in this way. 
the second question is, what do we do about the existing uh, uh, personal drafts related to these applications? So the, the, the sense that I'm having is that we work these in parallel. They stay as personal drafts, and we talk with the ISG as to where they are best adopted, whether it's DTNWG or not. Uh, that is what I have heard as they've gotten more maturity. Is there any dissent or, or comment about that position? Okay, all right. Our, our last topic uh, is going back to uh, the IPN URI. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Stephen has jumped into the queue at the last possible minute. Luckily, we're delay tolerant. Hi, Stephen. Can, can you just, what was the conclusion you had there on the, the you had three questions on, on the slide. Yeah, I know that you're right. We didn't actually answer those questions particularly well. The rough consensus we heard from the room based on that discussion was there was support for a generic document for application considerations sure. but no one arguing for adoption for either of the two SNTP or HTTP personal drafts but no one was saying these are wildly out of scope right now so I would suggest that Mark continued to refresh them and align them as the application considerations document proceeded right. and come back with an adoption request okay. so, at a no, later date. Okay, so then I, so my comment is, um, I, think the, I think it seems entirely reasonable that the DTN working group consider things like uh, interpersonal messaging in networks where there's a big disruption or delay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I think the scoping issue would land in this working group as opposed to doing something elsewhere. Um, and I don't know where it fits in terms of any of these documents, but I think before the working group spends effort on, let's say, the SMTP or HTTP things, I, somebody really needs to go and find out what are the requirements for messaging in some lunar scenario or mission scenario or whatever, because they may or may not require something like tunneling SMTP. Or they might require, you know, synchronizing message stores as we did years ago. So, I think that kind of figuring out requirements stuff is would be important before the working group spends time on different kinds of integrations with applications. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Agree. Yeah, Pete Resnick. So, looking at the SMTP document, for instance, keep in mind that at least for that one. It's not really SMTP. It's a gateway protocol for doing email that happens to come from SMTP over BP to something else that's doing SMTP. So it's not as if you are, or Mark is, creating a, a, you know, some extension to SMTP that really needs loads of applications area review, it's reusing a little gatewaying protocol that's in an informational document of the ancient times um, and bringing it to this. So it would be plausible that that would be a specific DTN working group item as opposed to something that's over in the applications area um, if, as Stephen says, it's actually needed for something. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and also there are some comments in, in the chat uh, related to that as well. But, but in the interest of time in, in our remaining seven minutes, uh, I do want to spend a little time on uh, the governance uh, discussion. Uh, for those who have been uh, working or uh, tracking the IPN URI updates, uh, one of the large updates, structural updates, was the idea of taking the 64-bit node number space and uh, sort of segmenting it into an upper 32 bits of an allocator identifier and a lower 32 bits of node numbers with the idea that allocator and node number together are a uniquely, uniquely identify a node with the example of having IPN colon 7.3.1 being a, a, a full IPN URI as opposed to IPN 3.1. Uh, in that, uh, if we accept the idea of allocators uh, and that we use those allocators as a way of segmenting uh, the management space of, of node numbers, then we need a registry of who allocators are so that we can identify them. 
and a question has been come up, a significant question on the mailing list of what does it mean to manage a registry of allocators in this space? Uh, right now, uh, the plan A uh, for how this is done is that a allocator ID registry would be created. Uh, IANA would manage that registry. The uh, registry would be expert review. Uh, of course, uh, with uh, IETF policies, if we needed appeal, if an expert said no to something, uh, there would be an appeal to IESG, and that is the default management position. With the idea that individual allocator IDs could be given out to individual organizations, uh, or ranges of allocator IDs could be given out to either traditional or emerging registrars who could then parcel them out as they see fit, which is a, a way that we do this with other things, like, for example, IPv6 uh, addresses. Uh, alternatively, uh, there is a management approach where we remove expert review and we request that ISG directly manage uh, this uh, allocator ID space, perhaps with the IESG coming back to experts if they have a particular question. But in all cases, the allocator ID ranges exist in an IANA registry that manages them and gives them out in this particular way. In that, uh, clearly the registry concern is this sort of first order, who gets individual registry IDs? And there are two significant questions that have come up. One is, how do we make sure that these small encodings, because we don't have very many of those, uh, are given out in a, in a pragmatic manner? And just generally speaking, how do we make sure that the allocation of these ranges are uh, according to a fair and transparent process, that we are avoiding land grabs, that we uh, allow new players in emerging spaces, particularly for space spaces, to, to have an even playing field, avoiding bias, apply rules consistently, and so on and so forth. So the question that we have to the working group is, is there a significant concern that expert review of the allocator ID registry uh, would be problematic? So can expert review meet the criteria of transparent and fair process, avoiding land grabs, allowing new players, and so on? Uh, or do we need to do something different? We are working to get uh, scheduling with the ISG in, in mid-August. We are putting a request to hold uh, new node number registries in the CBHE node number registry until we sort of understand uh, these policies and how the registries will be updated by the IPNURI update. But the, the question to the working group here is, are there specific concerns about whether or not expert review can meet these criteria? Absent comment here and uh, follow up on the mailing list, we will presume that there are not concerns with this review process. And, and uh, as mentioned in the, in the chat, that the ISG does appoint the designated experts. I see Scott Burley in the queue. And we will use this topic to run out our time and we can go a few minutes after because this is important. Uh, I'll be very brief, uh, Scott Burley, just wondering, have any uh, concerns been expressed already? Uh, is this, and, and, and what's the nature of those concerns? There have been uh, concerns expressed on the mailing list associated with whether or not a small number of expert review individuals may have either uh, a bias or an inconsistent rule set in how allocator ID ranges would be given out. So uh, so in that sense, the um, a core consideration is what uh, how would we constitute this body of experts? That's a wonderful question uh, because, so I'm going to jump in on this. To the best of my understanding, and I have been talking to Ayana about this and the IESG, the expert review process as part of a, a registry is a technical expertise review and is not a governance review. Ah, so this is, is this then breaking new ground? Not necessarily. It's breaking rare ground. So the parallels for other registries where this applies is, and somebody else used the very nice phrase, these are deployable numbers. So we're not talking about protocol flag bits. That's, mm. that's nice and simple to do. And most of the IANA registries are little protocol flag bits or status codes or whatever, and it's fine. But we're now talking about big deployable numbers like IP addresses, 
DNS, top level names, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, stuff people care about and build businesses and spend lots and lots of dollars on. And that puts it into a different class of fair use, accessibility, and so on. And a couple of, in the nicest possible way, geeks who understand the numbers are probably not the right people to go up against big corporate lawyers if a mistake is made. And I think that's the crux of some of the, the concerns. How, how much guidance are we getting then from IESG on how this has been done in the past and the rare instances where it has been done in the past? So chair hat on, if any of the current or previous IESG members would care to step to the mic to offer some advice, please join the queue. Mark, I see you're in the queue and you're an ex-ISG as well. And RAD, please join the queue. Um, I'm not sure about the fact that expert review is the right thing, but we're talking about it. So um, you're right that expert review is typically technical. Uh, if people care about... Uh, um, you know, things that may happen under the carpet, then that's easy to fix in the sense that many of those uh, expert review uh, done for some registries are actually handled in a public mailing list. I think Stephen, you wrote this also on the, on the chat. So there are things that enable, you know, other people to review what's going on if, and if an expert you know, is wrong. And usually there's more than one expert. So, so all this can be kind of managed almost okay. Uh, but as you said, uh, it's a different kind of registry because it's for deployments instead of protocol, you know, numbers and stuff. So, and I'm not sure expert review is the right thing either. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Scott Johnson. I see both. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my concern with expert review here is that this place is a, a significant amount of power uh, in the hands of just a couple individuals. Um, personally, those individuals would re need to receive significant guidance uh, from somewhere in order to perform that, uh, that function correctly. And I think probably we would, be, we would be better off with hierarchical um, allocation here, which sets it up so that both the default registry remains and is operated by IANA, uh, but as well, we uh, allow the community-based uh, stakeholder centric um, governance models that the things like the RIR system uh, have allowed, as well as uh, any potential new RIRs that may be added to that um, to that system to handle situations where uh, space law has not yet been written and jurisdictional terrestrial law is not appropriate. So, so Scott, with with that, if if the IANA registry allocates large blocks of allocator IDs to RIRs or ICANN or CCSDS or others, uh, mm -hmm. does that alleviate that concern? I believe so, yes. So Rick, with your hat on quickly jumping in, I, I had a nice chat with one of the guys from ICANN yesterday about how that process works and, and IANA uh, has confidence in the processes and procedures followed by ICANN and the RIRs. And therefore, although IANA holds the registries and owns the registries, they delegate these large chunks out to uh, ICANN in order to do this work for, for the IP addressing and, and AS numbers and things like that. That model seems to be the preferred way to go, I am hearing. Does, was, is that what you're trying to say, Scott? You, you find that would work? Uh, yes, I, 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 that model not only would work, but probably many of those institutions uh, with additions would work to fill that role. Uh, yeah, it's it's it, sorry, Rick again. Um, the model is what's being discussed here. The the guy from ICANN politely went, I don't I don't know what to do with these numbers, but um, the model itself is is valid. And then, and lastly, I know we're way beyond time, but uh, Eric, and thank you, Scott. 
Uh, yeah, sorry about running over time. I just wanted to say there there are several things here, uh, uh, analogs. You can um, uh, one maybe important thing to say up front is that uh, we, if we write a document that says Iona, please use expert review, we can shortly thereafter write another document that says Iona, we've changed our mind. Uh, okay. Because why not? Um, so uh, you could also write a document that says Iona. We have the highest possible standard for allocating things, and please don't ever do that again. But we spend a month and a half uh, pre-allocating the table with everything and anything that we want. Right, getting getting everybody signed up uh, isn't like there's there's lots of lots of opportunities here. So, okay. I think the only other thing was that there's a uh, uh, SNMP private enterprise numbers, the pen registrations. I mean, that's basically first come first serve. Uh, I think you're limited to one per organization, but you could invent an infinite number of organizations, I suppose, if you wanted to try to land grab that system, but it has not suffered uh, uh, any ill fate. So, uh, I will add one consideration to that comment, Eric. Sorry, Rick Taylor again. Um, the difference between those uh, enterprise numbers is, again, we have the Seabor encoding problem, which means little numbers are more precious than big numbers. And that's where they, the fairness and the, you know, oh, I want seven because it is much better than seven million. I think the OID encoding. Oh, yeah, OID is an ASN. Is, yeah. It, it, yeah. It gets, yeah, it gets pretty bad. All right. <laughs> 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 Uh, thank you all. Uh, we, we are at the end of this meeting. We will see everyone at 118, and we will see you on the mailing list. Have a great day. And on the mailing list, please suggest some text for that designated expert thing, that, that section, because it can't just be me writing what I think. I would really like some text suggestions, please. So I quickly got a private enterprise number corporately and I did all my